Decking, railing, lighting, furniture, fencing, framing. At Trex, we make the most in outdoor living because you deserve to get more from your life outdoors. So why not start bringing your ideas to life now with the brand that's engineering what's next? To learn more about all of the outdoor solutions Trex has to offer or to find a local retailer or a certified Trex Pro deck builder near you, visit trex.com. That's T-R-E-X dot com. Presented by Progressive Insurance. Live from the site of the 2018 NFL Draft. All this talk about Cleveland taking a quarterback at one and four. Please stop. Three words. Stop that. Please just stop the ridiculousness of trying to justify why you would do that. There's no reasoning to do it at all. We got we got loyal people with us here, Mike. As we continue on Golik and Wingo, ESPN Radio, ESPN News, live from 1010 Collins Event Center in Arlington for the NFL Draft. Just just a stone's throw away from AT&T Stadium where the draft will begin tonight. Glad you're with us. You guys, glad you're with us as well. Appreciate that. Yes. Hell yes. We are presented by Progressive Insurance. All phone guests join us on the Shell Pencil and Performance Line. Mike Golick, Mike Golick Jr., Trey Wingo here with you. This hour of Golick and Wingo is brought to you by, wait for it, La Quinta yes. and Suites. Book at LQ.com and win at business. we got a lot to get to. we got the playoffs from the NBA last night. we got Didi Gregorius and his bat warming up for the Yankees. we got hopefully that great gaseous ball in the sky warming up the 40-degree temperatures here in the greater it's happen. Arlington it's area. Happen. Yeah, you know what's going to happen? By the time we're done. Well, yeah. as, as we You're walk done before up. us, so get out. <laughs> Victory! Yeah. Dallas is just looking to break what is uh, around here, talking to a lot of people. Yeah. There's a definite sort of sensitivity about any time there's a big event in yeah. Dallas, everyone always feels they managed to get bad weather. So the forecast today is 78 and sunny. Yeah. It seems like Dallas is going to get what they were hoping for on night one of the draft. And after it went so well, you were in Philadelphia last year and yep. we heard everyone ranting and rave that NFC East rivalry going to rear its head I'm sure Jerry's got plenty of good stuff absolutely planned absolutely right I agree with that by the way it's cold here and it's my fault because you know I, I, I doomed us in the East to have three more weeks of winter when I said we were past it the last two times I had an extended dance play and uh, dance mix uh, time in Dallas was Super Bowl 45 yeah. ice storm yeah, I was. came last January uh, sadly for a family funeral three days Ice storm and snow. So yeah. every it's my fault. I apologize. Where to go? Trey? I apologize. You're it's extending our winner. You are Trey Wingo, known groundhog. It's on me. You know who also extends uh, wonderful awesomeness? Who's that? A Hasselbeck. A Hasselbeck. We're not going to tell you who it is. You're going to nope. have to figure it mm-hmm. out. Uh, one way or the other. So, A. Hasselbeck, one of our ESPN NFL analysts, joins us now on Golik and Wingo. A. Hasselbeck, uh, thanks for being with us. Uh, you should know, uh, in uh, the draft that was redone of 1998 recently, uh, you went from being uh, very late to a first-round pick. So, congratulations, wow. A. Hasselbeck. Yeah, do I get first-round money for that? I, uh, I'm just curious. <laughs> No, we're paying you first round money now. That would be awesome. <laughs> Great yeah. comeback, Trey, as always. <laughs> so, brother, take us through what the quarterbacks must be going through tonight. Obviously, there are somewhat ridiculous, extenuating circumstances right now around Josh Allen, who may may go number one overall to the Cleveland Browns. But what's the angst like waiting for your name to be called, knowing that, hey, every team wants a quarterback and they may take you? Yeah, well, I think it's really exciting. The interesting thing about this year's draft, and I can't remember a draft that was like this, none of these guys got to play right away. Every team that's talking about taking a, uh, a young quarterback in the first round already has their starter set for this year. You know, whether it's Cleveland, they went on and got Tyrod Taylor. You know, Eli's with the New York Giants. You know, Josh McCown's with the Jets. Uh, Denver has Case Keenum. You go on down the line, Ryan Tannehill with the Dolphins, uh, I believe, is the starter. Buffalo brought in uh, A.J. McCarron. Uh, you know, so none of these guys have to play right away. They're going to want to, and that's why they're going to be drafted in the first round. But I think that's probably the biggest thing. Most of these guys, honestly, they just want to know where they're going to live. Am I going to live in Cleveland or am I going to live in New York? That kind of thing. And, and, and Matt, taking it a step further, when they when they get drafted and they go to their team and they go to the OTAs, now certainly during this process when they meet with teams, they get a little bit of a playbook they have to regurgitate to, to try and go through the interview process. But go back to that when you let when Boston College, then you go into the pros and you're given that playbook for the first time, trying to digest it when it may look like a different language to you. 
Yeah, well, I think that's actually a benefit that these guys, that some of the rookies will have coming in this year. And that's, you know, you're absolutely right, uh, Golik. That's, that's the number one thing, learning that playbook to show what you can do. But these rookies, you know, we talk about all about, you know, hear these coaches complain about, oh, we don't have enough time. Uh, then OTAs, there's all these rules. We can only have so much time coaching our players. Those rules really do not apply to the rookies. You have as much time as you want with the rookies. So if you're trying to get a young rookie quarterback ready to play, you know, a la Dak Prescott stepped up and was ready to play. He went from third-string quarterback to starting quarterback, uh, not by design, but he had all that time in the offseason with his coaching staff. You know, those OTA, OTA rules didn't apply. Those guys should be able to get up to speed, at least mentally, in the classroom. Now, whether they can do it on the football field, that's another question. Talking to Matt Hasselback on the show, Pennzoil Performance Line. And, Matt, I'm interested, outside of the playbook, and you were a guy that was you know, the quarterback, the face of the franchise, when you are one of these rookies going into the building for the first time in this offseason, what are you trying to show right away? What's the message you're trying to send to the rest of that building as you become the guy that we know is going to have that face of the franchise pressure put on him? Yeah, no one cares where you were drafted. You know, that's what they say. But quite honestly, if you were drafted high, they expect more out of you. And I think the biggest thing for a young quarterback, you know, you come in your draft class. Your draft class is going to be roughly, you know, call it 20 guys, meaning the draft picks and the unsigned, undrafted free agents that they signed. So you're going to have 20 guys roughly that you're going to be working out with each and every day that you're going to have to earn the respect of that small group of guys. Like, they got to say, you know what, who's our alpha dog? Who's our leader? You know what, you're our leader. Like, we'll follow you. You set the tone. Uh, you're the guy, you know, be, you're, you're first in, you're last out, you know, those types of things. But also, while you're doing that, while you're trying to earn the respect of that group, you're earning the respect of the staff, the athletic trainers, the equipment guys, uh, the coaches that are watching, like really everybody in the building, you know, how you're treating people, all that kind of stuff. And so you almost have a reputation when those veterans do show up. You know, they say to the equipment room, they say to the athletic training room, they say, hey, what, what's, uh, what's, what's the new guy like? And you're going to get a first impression that way. And that, that's going to matter immediately. And you see guys that have taken advantage of that, and then, the, you know, they start out on the right foot, and you see guys that have screwed that up from day one and it really has been a crash and burn situation for them all right a hassel back with us nfl analyst joins us now on golik and wingo so everybody has their guy said Hasselback in this draft when we're talking about the quarterbacks we could have five maybe six which would tie the record set back in 1983 a Hasselback, who's your guy quarterback wise in this draft yeah, well, to me, listen, it, it's, uh, it's, it's really a, a two-horse race in the top five for me. And I, Josh Rosen is the quarterback that I think is uh, the guy to draft in this draft, especially if you're Cleveland. Now, I've not heard anybody say that Josh Rosen's going to Cleveland, but for Cleveland, you've got to think about, okay, who do I know can play at the next level? Who do I absolutely know can be a starter for a long time? And for me, you look at the tape, it's Josh Rosen. He is just so smooth. He, he was, you know, the playbook that he's running reminds me of a cross between a Peyton Manning playbook, a Tom Brady playbook. I mean, he's already done it, and he processes information at the line of scrimmage so quickly. He's got great eyes and great vision down the field. He can make all those throws. I wouldn't fall in love with this uh, who's got the highest upside talk. Um, and, and really, that, that, that what I just said for Cleveland is true for the New York Giants. It's true for the New York Jets. Uh, Josh Rosen would be the guy. Sam Darnold would be the other guy that I think can, can play for sure. All right, A. Hasselbeck, you're not the only one that feels that way. Golik feels very strongly about Josh Rosen as well, and I think I'm with you. Those would be the two guys that I would lean the heaviest on. Why do you think people are looking at Josh Rosen sideways sometimes then knowing all of those things? Well, I think, you know, uh, I was at Josh's pro day, and, you know, one thing I know from my own pro day, which unfortunately only one team showed up for, uh, that was the Green Bay Packers, and the, the right quarterback team. coach. It was the right team. But what I realized, I, so it was snowing so bad that day for my pro day that, um, that I couldn't work out. There was nowhere to work out. We didn't have an indoor facility. And so Andy Reid never worked me out. Instead, he met everyone in the building. You know, I'm sure he talked to the equipment room. He talked to the athletic training room. He talked to the, uh, the head coach's, you know, assistant, secretary, you know, like all those types of people uh, found out about me. And so I think that's maybe where some of the hesitation comes uh, going back to from when Josh Rosen was in high school, you know, to then when he was in college. And like it, the, the stories follow you. For me personally, I, I like the guy. He reminds me of Aaron Rodgers. I, I just think and one of his curses – 
one of his curses, which is a blessing, is he might be the smartest guy in the room all the time. And, you know, and sometimes that can come off the wrong way. But I like him. I'd want the ball in his hands if, uh, if I was calling plays. And really that's how, you know, I've chosen to look at this thing. All right, so Matt, as we look at a lot of these first-round guys, the expectation is for a Saquon Barkley, a Bradley Chubb, a Quentin Nelson, and, and guys like that on down the list for a bit are going to be on the field immediately. They are supposed to be more of that finished product that are ready to play right now. And I completely agree with you about the quarterbacks in twofold. I think Rosen is the number one guy, and none of these guys are expected to be the guy in the beginning. So when you draft a quarterback, you don't draft him for his rookie year. You draft him for the next five to ten years. What do you look you look for in that quarterback that says, I think he is going to be that guy even six, seven years down the road over other guys? Well, I just look for the consistency thing. And, again, it's, it's, uh, it's sort of the floor. Like, what do I think this guy's floor is? Josh Rosen's floor is a lot higher than everybody else's floor in my mind. But at the same time, I, I get it. Like, you know, you, you say, hey, listen, can we squeeze more years out of our starter? Can Eli Manning play three more years? Do we really need to invest in uh, a Josh Rosen right now when there are great players? There is a great running back there. We do could get Bradley Chubb, who would – it just fits so nicely with the story of drafting Lawrence Taylor once upon a time. Um, you know, those are great players at the top of the draft, and so you got to decide, do you want to invest, much like the Green Bay Packers did a long time ago? Uh, Aaron Rodgers sat for four years behind Brett Favre before he got a chance to play. I mean, I lived it myself. I sat for three years behind Brett Favre, thinking, oh, I'll just wait this out. And then I'm like, you know what, maybe that's not the right decision. Either way, that was taken from me because the Packers decided, they said, you know what, we're going to trade you anyway. They traded me to Seattle. And, you know, Brett Favre kept playing for I don't even know how many more years. And so that's, those are the decisions that these teams have to make. But uh, quite honestly, you've seen where teams have overinvested in the quarterback position, a la the Philadelphia Eagles. It's worked out. Teams that have underinvested in the quarterback position, it has not worked out. Uh, John Dorsey is kind of a Ron Wolf disciple. And he's a guy that would always overinvest in the quarterback position. Uh, Matt, uh, I was talking to Matt Hassel back on the Shell Pennzoil performance line. I'm curious, a, a veteran quarterback, and we know a lot of these teams up top, we've talked about it, have veteran quarterbacks on the roster. When we're looking at teams that might be drafting in other positions, teams that might be looking at Saquon Barkley or Quentin Nelson or Bradley Chubb, when you're a veteran quarterback and you're looking at the potential for you, would you rather have protection? Would you rather have another weapon on your offense? If you're looking at it and saying, what do I value as a quarterback around me, what would that have been for you? Yeah, that, this happened to me a couple times. Jim Morrow was my head coach um, in 2009, and the Seahawks were picking, like, number five. And they were deciding between, hey, do we draft Mark Sanchez or do we go with Aaron Curry? Do we want, like, the sure thing in the draft as a linebacker who's going to help our team overall? Or do we go with, the you know, kind of like the next quarterback, the heir apparent, if you will? And that was the decision that they had to make. They went defense. You know, later on, uh, Pete Carroll came. He was my head coach, and we traded away some picks to sign Charlie Whitehurst to be the next quarterback in Seattle. And, Touchdown, uh, Jesus. I, and, it, well, and I remember the conversation, and he was like, hey, you know, if you're a competitor, you shouldn't worry about the guy that we're bringing in to compete. And I'm like, listen, I, it has nothing to do with that. I'm not worried about it at all. But, like, I'm trying to, you know, I'm getting older. I'm in my 30s. I'm 35. I want to, like, try to win a Super Bowl. So, you know, a, a corner or a guard or a – you know, a, a wide receiver, like that, that's what I was hoping for, not trading away picks for you, the guy that's going to replace me. And I think that's probably, probably the case for a guy like Eli Manning. He's saying, listen, hey, I would love a great running back, a game changer. Or I would love, you know, the next Michael Strahan on the other side of the ball. You're like, that, that's where his mindset is probably at. And so, you know, I, I agree with that. And as an organization, those are the tough decisions. A. Hassel back with us on Golik and Wingo as we're breaking down the draft. And I, I know I'm taking you out of your wheelhouse a little bit, partner, but uh, a lot of people saying that the quarterbacks will be overdrafted as they tend to be overdrafted uh, a lot of times. And we'll probably get a 50% hit-miss ratio with the quarterbacks that go in the first round. And then the prevailing thought process is in is some of the best actual players in this draft will probably be drafted 6 through 12. So take the quarterbacks out of it. The best pro prospect from a guy who's been in the league as long as you were and has seen guys come from the fifth round, undrafted, wherever, to have great success, the best non-quarterback in this draft is who? Well, Steve Hutchinson will get mad that I don't pick Quentin Nelson. Cause, you know, so will so the two guys sitting on the set with me. <laughs> but listen, I'm going to say Bradley Chubb, and the reason I'm going to say it is uh, I called the 
uh, the NC State Louisville game and Lamar Jackson this year. And Lamar Jackson is the most electric, amazing uh, player in college football this year. I mean, he's more dangerous with the ball in his hands than Saquon Barkley. I mean, the guy had 119 touchdowns in college. That's ridiculous. 119. Even with that, Bradley Chubb single handedly, as a defensive lineman, took over that game. I mean, it was unbelievable to see in person, and you miss it sometimes when you're just watching cut-ups. This guy took over the game. So far, it's like blocking extra points when an extra point needed to be blocked. The personality, the leadership, um, I I think he is the guy we're going to be talking about for a long time. If this was last year, he would have been the first overall pick in the draft. I have no doubt about that. Bradley Chubb, NC State. And they took a pass rusher with the first overall pick last year in Cleveland. Right. Uh, a. Hasselbeck, you're the best, brother. Appreciate you. Thanks, Matt. Any t- anytime, guys. See you. Yeah. Again, that was Matt Hasselbeck. Yeah. We just like to well, play along. Mike and I both said it about ten times. Yeah. 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 So I, I was, I, little, doesn't matter. I was yeah. going down the road with yeah. A. Hasselbeck. Yeah, if you, yeah, if you, we figured that out. If you read his Twitter handle, it looks like A. Hasselbeck yeah. since you've got the at sign. Right. So I'll just say that you were reading that one very a. literally. A. Hasselbeck. <laughs> Here's the thing about Bradley Chubb, and it relates a little bit to what's going on with Josh Allen, who, by the way, we've learned will not join us. He is not and going I, to join And us. I would say that if I were him, I probably would not would do that as well. Let, let, let's talk about that for a moment. Yeah. Is, is that the route you would go? I, I'm, I'm wondering because he, he did talk about it. Yeah. Uh, so he had this set up, and you knew you're going to you're going to get asked about it. So what's what's the call? He obviously made, and that's fine. Yeah. Listen, yeah. absolutely his choice to do. Quite honestly, him coming on the show and talking about it or canceling or not is not going to affect his draft no, position. I, I, but thinking from the the PR, PR perspective. side of it. Is it better to come? Okay, I made the commitment to come here on the show and talk about it, to just talk about it, as Mike and I said, we'll ask him a question about it, and then we move on, or yeah. to do what he did and, and cancel. Well, look, some would say, and I, I, I could say that I that it might have been maybe a better thing for him to to do that. Right. To just say, But I, I would guess from his perspective and his handlers, and this would be my guess, it wasn't probably a him as much as his right. handlers, right. saying, look, yeah. you're going to get asked about it at the draft. Mm-hmm. Everyone will see the draft. Right. You ask it at the draft. You answer it at the draft. I've done. I'm sorry. It's a one-time hit, and you don't have to do it 500 times. Right. That would be my takeaway from that. Oh, that. That would be my takeaway. Money also tends to get in the way of these things. I have a feeling his appearance today was sponsor-affiliated, and yep. I can't imagine this is something that a sponsor also necessarily true. wants right. tagged with their appearance on this set. So we'll just say that Josh owes us one in the future. Josh, yeah. once you are drafted, come back on the show, or else we'll, you know, Maybe uh, not be the biggest fan. Maybe we'll be Josh Rosen show instead maybe, of a Josh maybe, Allen. Maybe show. we can get Josh Allen tomorrow yeah, after he's drafted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That come would be great. To your point, that that is a very good point. That he's going to have to answer it. So, and you know, he's going to get asked about it tonight. Do it tonight, the one time, and everybody and, and sees it. We yeah, don't have yeah. to. We don't have to parse it out a hundred different times. Once that would the be check my clears, thing. come back. <laughs> a similar situation, by the way. Just so you know, uh, on NFL Live, once we were scheduled to have Reggie Bush on yeah. uh, at the Super Bowl in Miami. Uh, between the Colts and the Bears, and that's when the whole house stuff was going right, on, and right. more stuff came out. And you know, I did an interview with Reggie before the draft, and he and his people, we didn't see eye to eye about what yeah, I asked, and that's yeah. fine. And I said, "Look, we're glad to have you on the show, but we're going to have to ask you about that question." Right. And he goes, "Well, I don't want to answer that question." I said, "That's fine. Yeah, I'll ask you. You can move on." And then uh, he was like, "Yeah, I don't want to do that," so we didn't do it. Didn't and, do it. and you know what? We ended up, and then Reggie and I are fine now. But I had to ask that That's question the in the frame of the situation. We have to ask it, yeah. but we can't control how they answer it. Correct. They answer it how they want, and then and then you move on. Yeah. And, and real quickly, before we bring in uh, our, our fine fiddle and fits, yeah, um, we I mentioned there's a combination or a connection between Josh Allen and Bradley Chubb. Things change. Bradley Chubb was rated. Get this, Bradley Chubb was rated as the 733rd best best prospect in his draft class. 733. He's going to go in the top five of the draft. Yeah, yeah. So things that people thought you were as a teenager yeah. change a little bit when you go to college and go through this process. And that's the process for Josh Allen as well as the process for Bradley Chubb from 733 to top five in the draft. And for the process for Jason Fitz, who yes. has changed from fiddle player to sports radio host yeah. now. Oh, nice segue. Oh, Dude, well it's done. like you're doing good in this business. Do it because I love you. Fitzy, talk to me. What do you got? Man, I am just, A, I'm, you know, I'm no Josh Allen, but I'm just happy to be on with all of you guys. And sort of, a, you know, I feel like we need one big, large group hug. I'm bummed. I'm not banned out. Uh, okay. We could use the warmth. I'm not yeah, going to lie to you. Over yeah. under 30 seconds for the first hug reference from Jason Fitz. Fitz, you got any tweets I need to know about? Uh, no, 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 no. Very, very, very good on that. I will say, yeah, I was listening to your Josh discussion, obviously. The only thing, only counter argument that I would make to that is if you're a team that's just sort of, 
on the outside looking in, taking a, a side eye to see how he handles things. He did have an opportunity to come on this morning and answer that question in a big, big way, which could have made a statement. So I, I still think that there's a positive for him making an appearance, even through all the controversy. I still think he'll make a much larger statement tonight. Yeah, I, I mean, mean, it's that's... one of those things where, you know, his handlers, and I agree with you that there's a team around him looking at the pros and cons of it. Yeah. And, and as, as we said, you know, no, it's fine. You know, just yeah. maybe we'll come <clears> on tomorrow. We'll get him on at some point. But Happy it's a decision, decision he's going to make. Jason, you guys got the, the Twitter shows the next couple of days. What's going on with those? Yeah, so we're doing a show called On the Clock, and it's, uh, it's going to be one of those Twitter shows that uh, we do. In fact, the uh, Junior will be with me tomorrow, but uh, tonight we'll start uh, right around 7 o'clock. Actually, I think we're going to now start it a, a, a few minutes early. Uh, so right before the draft starts, we'll, we'll start, and it's going to be me, Nina Kimes, Dominique Foxworth, and Field Yates tonight on Twitter. So you can just go to twitter.com slash ESPN, and uh, the live feed will be up there. And uh, essentially from the first pick uh, Thursday all the way until the very last pick on Friday, uh, we'll have different groupings. We'll be hanging out. We'll do some stupid stuff like we always do. But we'll try and give you some great uh, draft content from uh, from the eyes of some of the other people at ESPN. So while you're watching on ESPN, you can also have the Twitter feed up. You can see all of the opinions, all the thoughts from everybody, and uh, we're going to have a little fun. Oh, that's great. So you're going all the way through the last pick on Friday. Talk to me when you go to the last pick on Saturday, oh, champ. Oh, uh, oh, oh, my God. God. Come on. Oh, Friday night. I got a oh, oh, I got plans on Saturday. You we're are not, we're so not big time enough oh, for yeah. that, Trey. It takes it takes time. There's a growth process. We're, we're the we're you know we're sort of like the new kids on the block over there doing this. Uh, this You're the funny, acorn that thing. becomes the oak, Jason. You're the acorn <laughs> right, that right. becomes the oak. Uh, real quickly, <laughs> say it. Just how much do you love your Preds in the next round? Uh, you know what? It's just it's a failing on the NHL that the two best teams in the league will play in this round. This is a tough, tough matchup. Winnipeg could easily beat them, but home ice has to matter for something. The Preds have it, so I think the Preds take this. But I wouldn't be surprised if it's a seven-game series, and it really could go either way. That's the last fair and reasonable take I'll give you on the Preds, though. It's super fandom after that. Well, by the way, as you're doing this, I'm staring at the picture we put up on ESPN News of you, and it's like you're trying to hypnotize us. <laughs> Look deep into my eyes and understand that everything I'm saying is from a Nashville perspective, and you will like it. All right, Finch, good to talk to you, buddy. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. Thanks, 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 Appreciate it. You know, that, that he had quite the stare there in that photo. Yeah, quite that the stare. Very central. It'll be yeah. fun. The Twitter show, you're part of the Toronto. Won't be on your couch, though. That yeah, we'll, is, we'll right? not be on my couch. We've got a studio for it and everything, but he mentioned Mina Kimes, Dominique, uh, 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 Field Yates. Yeah. I, was, I almost went with their morning roast co host and Clinton Yates. Right. But Field Yates all joining us there. So we'll get Mina's big board. We'll see uh, all the draft analysis from a guy like Dominique who played a good long time in the league. It's right. going to be a good time. All right. Golden Wingo presented by Progressive Home Insurance. Getting a quote is easier than ever. Coming up, our our next guest played with Jordan, but he's from Cleveland. So where is he on MJ and LeBron? We'll ask him next. Hey, everyone. Mike Golick here. Support for the Golick Wingo podcast comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Chances are you're confident when it comes to your work, your hobbies, your life. Rocket Mortgage gives you that same level of confidence when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. Rocket Mortgage is simple, allowing you to fully understand all the details and be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash mics. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org number 3030. I'm a one-trick pony, literally. I show up at kids' parties and act cute. That's pretty much it. So excuse me for being bitter when Geico says not only could we save you money on car insurance, but we do more, like give you 24-7 access online, over the phone, or even via our award-winning mobile app. Well, ooh-la-la, la, aren't they multi-talented? <laughs> hey, I said organic carrots. <laughs> Geico. Expect great savings and a whole lot more. Goal can win go on ESPN Radio and ESPN News live from 1010 Collins Event Center in Arlington for the NFL Draft. We are presented by Progressive Insurance. We've got a band of faithful here that have been with us all morning. Yeah. We appreciate that. And oh, by the way, as we are cresting the 7.30 hour here Central Time, the sun is sun rising is in the up. sky. Yes, it is. So the temperature's warming. 
and it's hitting us on the set and our wonderful staff and oh, yeah. crew here yeah. that want to make sure we're always put in the best position and yeah. have the lighting right. They saw the sun was coming up and they started to put a sunscreen up so it wouldn't hit us in the face. And we were like, no, 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 no. Let, no. It, let, it. let that beta carotene wash on us right now. Uh-huh. Soak in that vitamin D because that temperature is going up and we could use the degrees. So if it looks a little bad on ESPN News... My face never looks good anyway, so don't Very, worry about that it. That is the gospel truth right there. Don't worry about it. We'll just let that sunshine soak it in. <laughs> and we are delighted to be joined now on the Shell Penzoil performance, performance line by someone who performed at a very high level all the time when he was playing, former NBA All-Star, and one of the most intimidating players in the history of the NBA, Charles Oakley. Uh, Charles, thanks for being with us this morning. Uh, I no just problem. Wonder- good morning. Good morning. Good morning. As you watch the NBA playoffs as they're presently played out now and as they're officiated, how much do you kind of laugh at the way it's officiated now as opposed to when you guys were battling under the boards in your day? Well, I laugh when the players walk up to them. Every player thing they get fouled every play. I hate that. They walk up to the official. I mean, he has a job to do. You do your job, know your skill level, and you know it's a foul, not foul. They're going to call foul. That's why they got them out there to control the game. So, I mean, officiating got a tough job these days because there's a lot of delay calls. And, you know, you wait two seconds and the other guy's heading out court. They make a call. The guy's getting mad. So, I don't know if they need to fix that. I'll just call what you see. Yeah, it seems they're calling what they're seeing. And we saw some of the calls may or may not have had an effect on the game last night. But I know as players, when we talked about this, no matter what sport you're in, you have to just move past them and continue to play. Right. So your thought on the, the Cavaliers and the Pacers this series, a little closer than I think some people thought, and how the end of that game went. Well, I um, mean, you know, when you come away in the first game of a series, you always change the narrative of the series. So Cleveland had to win the game, then and they went home, Cleveland – you know, so now Cleveland got the lead 3-2. Uh, last night game was, you know, in Cleveland they was on fire. You know, downtown the queue. Um, they had the baseball game going. I'm in Cleveland. So it was it was a beautiful thing. The weather changing, the draft coming up. So Cleveland is really, you know, all eyes on Cleveland today. All eyes certainly on Cleveland, and all eyes have been on LeBron James this postseason. Uh, I'm interested, Charles, what have you made of what we've seen out of LeBron so far? This is more effort than we're used to seeing him have to give in the first round. How does that affect the player of his caliber and a veteran player who's used to being able to conserve more energy until the later parts of the postseason? Well, you know, it's like a boxing match. You know, sometimes you want to come out first two or three rounds, you know, see what the partners have. And but LeBron got to come out now. You know, first quarter, third quarter, every quarter, and because he, he he's the flow general for the team, and he, if he ain't working, the team ain't working. And just you know, Kyrie Lau is co-pilot from last year, and it all of, is on his shoulder. They don't have no one else can make you know, no one better for us like beating them off the dribble, and uh, they depend on him for four quarters, and he put him producing. Um, you know, they got to go with any closing up Friday. Uh, Charles Oakley with us uh, on uh, Golden Wingo this morning. And the, it's funny you mentioned it's a boxing match because nobody knows about uh, fighting or boxing <laughs> matches in the NBA better than you. And this is one of those questions I all, people always ask about, and you're the best person to try and answer it. When you look at the basketball that's being played now with you know the run, catch, and shoot, and hit the threes and all that kind of stuff, as opposed to the, the interior defense that was played when you guys were in your heyday, whether it was with the Bulls or the Knicks. And people always say, well, who would win a matchup between the 90s Bulls or the current Golden State Warriors right now? And my question always is, which rules are they playing under? Because if they're playing under the rules they're playing now, I'm pretty sure Golden State could just keep shooting and get away with anything. But as you well know, whether it was your time with the Knicks or the time with the Bulls, there were a completely different set of circumstances that all those little fancy things that they tried to do, you just wouldn't let them do. Well, I think it's going to be a big difference because, you know, the Bulls, you know, they, they had a great run back in the 90s. Those Bulls, they have a great run now. Um, I think you have better coaching game situation back in our era because we were just to shooters like this. And ain't no three guys going to get 20 some a night. You know, I think on the team that did, that was Denver Nuggets back, you know, they had Dan Ischel, Allen, and all them guys. But I think, you know, with Scottie Pittman, Dennis Robin, Michael, I mean, you got three good defenders, not just offensive players. So, I mean, you know, it's Golden State, you know, this is the, it's the era, and they're having a great time with it. Uh, they got some great players, but, I mean, that's just, you can't, 
it is like an apple and an orange. You know, most people want an apple than an orange, and they're gonna go with Chicago. But uh, they doing their job. They showing people they they can play. They going to the finals. They making you know they playing with one of the, with that one of their best players now in the second round. But they got to be very careful with New Orleans. New Orleans playing old school basketball right now. Looking forward to the the off season for teams that aren't in the playoffs. One of your former teams, obviously the Knicks, and one you're so associated with, and with the players that they have right now, the youth of that team, and what they're building around. What kind of head coach should they be looking for? Well, head coaches, you know, been a big thing for the organization. I mean, the best thing they could ever try to do was be head coach with Phil Jackson. If he didn't take the job, so you know, it must be a problem. Uh, right now. I would go with a guy, you know, Mark Jackson got a lot of good experience. Um, you know, Stackhouse is young. Um, I would go with, some, you know, someone who played the game. Someone, they said the game has changed for, you know, how you treat players and younger players need a lot more attention. You can't do this, can't do that. But when you're trying to win, they got to listen, though. Somebody got to get some structure somewhere. And that's all I see by watching these games. It's so bad. Why New Orleans is going so well? They got Rodno. They got a point guard who's going to play and get the ball to the right guy. It's too many guys shooting the ball who can't shoot. That's why teams are bad. They have no kind of structure and won't nobody tell the guys how to play the right way. So we'll see what the Knicks do. I mean, they need some pieces. Well, speak, speaking of a guy that told people what to do and how to do it, that was you when you played. Look, there was no doubt when you were playing you were the baddest dude in the league, and you weren't afraid to well, go up and let anybody know you were the baddest dude in the league. What, what was, what's, what, the, what's the one story you can tell us about a guy that thought he was going to try you and you said, don't even bother? Um, probably when Otis thought he bowled me and turned around and see it was me, probably like, oh, wow. But no, uh, in this league, it just uh, we need to get back to that. I don't mind guys, you know. You got to tell guys they roll, and you, and you do not have the guys. If you don't know your role. You better have a good point guard who can understand basketball. If not, you're not going to win. And you can see a lot of these younger teams. Uh, look at Utah. They give it one of their best players. They didn't, you know, went to uh, Boston. They got Mitchell came in doing a great job. Uh, Philly, you know, Philly in the process of finally coming around. You know, we've been waiting for, you know, like buying a house. You know, it's on the market. Now Philly, now Philly look good. Philly look good, and New Orleans look good. So two surprise teams so far. Utah, after last night, I don't know. I don't know they can bounce back. Yeah, they certainly did. Charles, we appreciate you getting up with us this morning. Always a pleasure to watch you play. And, you, uh, you, got got Thor- a, you got to ask me a question about my Browns. Okay. <laughs> Charles, let me you ask guys, you a question. I'm in, about I'm in Cleveland. I came home, and I know this was a, probably one of the biggest moments in Cleveland history of anything. You know, LeBron hit the buzzer last, winning last night, and the Cleveland got two picks in the top five. So tonight, you know, they got a lot of things, tailgate, this and that, going to see the But I'm going down to my man's place and watch the game tonight. All right, Charles, and, uh, we'll see what happens. Okay, all right. Appreciate you, brother. Thanks, Charles. <laughs> I'd like Mel and Todd to do an NFL mock draft solely based on hand size. Tremendously strong, big hands for ball security is very important. Golick and Wingo on the road, presented by Progressive Insurance. Well, now, you know what they say about big hands. Sports Center, brought to you by Dollar Shave Club. Give your bathroom the cleaning it deserves. Get rid of all the junk that's lying around. Freshen it up with high-quality products from Dollar Shave Club. They deliver everything you need to look, smell, and feel your best. Give the club a try. Go to dollarshaveclub.com slash Golik. We continue on Golik and Wingo, ESPN Radio, ESPN News, and yay, verily, the sun has crested in the sky in the 1010 Collins Event Center, and it is glorious. Yes, a lot of fans right behind us getting the the benefit of the sun as well. They all hung around all four hours. Great job out of them. Just drink it in. Yeah. Trey Wingo, Mike Golick, Mike Golick Jr. Again, the draft starts tonight, and this has been one of the most unpredictable drafts of all time because... We really don't know who's going to be the number one pick. It's no. very unusual not to know with some degree of certainty at this point. But wait, hang on. Play those chimes. Thank you very much. Adam Schefter reporting. The Browns continue to keep their decision on their number one pick a secret. But there is a mounting belief from head coaches and general managers around the league that Cleveland will take quarterback baker mayfield with the number one overall pick that from espn's adam schefter and as a a friend of mine that worked at espn for many years would say 
That's a wow. Yeah, that is a wow. That's a wow. Uh, it's certainly a direction I would not go. Um, because? Well, I mean, I, 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 as I said, I would have Josh Rosen, the number one quarterback. After that, it would be Sam Darnold. Um, uh, so that, that would be my top two quarterbacks. Baker Mayfield would not be there. Um, Josh Allen would not be there. As I've talked about Josh Allen with the, the completion percentage is a big red flag for me. <laughs> Baker Mayfield, he, I think we're doing too much comparisons to Russell Wilson, which he is not. He's not fast enough. And Drew Brees, which he is not or is yet proven to be. The so mo- one of the most accurate I, throwers in NFL history. I have a problem doing that. I, I see the potential there. And as I said about Baker, who does a lot of things on the fly, and Lamar Jackson, who does a lot of things with his legs, it's intriguing to me because of the way NFL offenses are now incorporating that more. So instead of saying, oh, wow, those guys can't do it in the NFL because of the NFL system, it's getting incorporated more so they have more potential to do it. But with, with Baker, I still think a lot of, even though he's done better from the pocket, he does a lot of things on the fly that, in my opinion, he's not going to get away with at the next level because he can get caught, doesn't have the elusiveness of the Russell Wilson, so I don't, I don't really like the comparison. He, he doesn't, doesn't do a bad job of finding windows because he is six foot tall uh, of throwing through, but I, 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 have, I have some doubts about him. I'll just say this, the accuracy portion, I mean, if you're looking for accuracy coming out of this quarterback trap, you'll be hard-pressed to find someone with the acumen of Baker Mayfield. That's true. The but most accurate quarterback in college of these guys coming out in this draft. But let's remember he played his games in the Big 12 where you don't have to be that accurate to win because nobody plays defense in the Big 12. I, I, you know what? Understood, but when you go and you watch the tape in that offense, it's a complex offense. It Lincoln is. Riley calls it a is. great you're, offense. You're exactly right. Those it are is all not things, what people think. Those are all things that work in his favor, so I, I, I can. You know, we've seen it with deep passing numbers for him on down the list. The other thing that interests me, though, is fit, because who is the current starting quarterback for the Cleveland Browns? That would be Tyrod Taylor. It's Tyrod Taylor. Taylor, a guy who last year did a lot with his legs, is a great quarterback as far as picking up first downs and getting yardage on plays where it breaks down, almost like a pseudo check down for him. Right. And so you've got Hugh Jackson, who's used even his less mobile quarterbacks as runners later on uh, in that offense, so you wonder how the fit works there, is you've got a guy who you can bring along a guy that you're trying to bring up underneath Tyrod Taylor as the starter not having to alter your playbook much having a guy that fits in with what you want to do from the top down on there so it makes the transition actually a lot easier behind closed doors. And Adam Schefter will will join us here in just a little bit to talk about this but he's also put something else out there on Twitter and this is something, you know, people have knocked USC quarterbacks since Carson Palmer about, you know, what what they've done out of USC and it hasn't been very much here's the cold fact when it comes to Big 12 quarterbacks in recent memory. Uh, this is from, uh, from Hembo. Paul, Hembo. Hembo. Paul and yeah, The Greek uh-huh. god of stats. Eight Big 12 quarterbacks have been drafted in the first round. That group is a combined 58 g- games below 500 in the NFL. And that would be Ryan Tannehill, Sam Bradford, Vince Young, uh, RG3, Blaine Gabbert, Brandon Whedon, Josh Freeman, and Patrick Mahomes. Uh- and- uh, yeah. And, and uh, Mahomes is 1-0 and became the first Kansas City Chief quarterback to win a game as a starter since Todd Blackledge in 1983 drafted by the Kansas yeah. City Chiefs. Look, I'm not say- we're not saying this will hold. We're saying this is history. And that's one of the yeah. things that is going against Baker Mayfield as well as his size. Yeah, it, it definitely is. I, I've asked this a while ago. Name me the Big 12 quarterback who's had major success in the NFL. RG3 had a year. Uh, some say Bradford being number one had some injuries that certainly derailed He's made his a lot career. of money. But the other guys, you know, have, have not done a ton. So there is something to that. Everyone thinks Pat Mahomes will break out of that mold. Yeah. But it's one game. We have to wait and see. So... I, I, this is a, not a route. I would go if I was the Cleveland Browns. We'll see if they go down this road. Boy, this is interesting. And it's gonna, look, it's going to be electric tonight inside AT&T Stadium. Again, you can catch it on ESPN, ESPN Radio, the ESPN app, and catch up with Fitz and everybody on Twitter about what's going on. Uh, and, again, Adam Schefter will be here in just a few minutes to talk about the big news that he's hearing Baker. Decking, railing, lighting, furniture, fencing, framing. At Trex, we make the most in outdoor living because you deserve to get more from your life outdoors. So why not start bringing your ideas to life now with the brand that's engineering what's next? To learn more about all of the outdoor solutions Trex has to offer or to find a local retailer or a certified Trex Pro deck builder near you, visit Trex.com. That's T-R-E-X dot com. It is Golick and Wingo, Mike Golick Jr., Mike Golick Sr. We've sent Trey Wingo off to prepare for the NFL draft. Get ready for that tonight as we are live 
in Arlington from the Co- Co- Collins Event Center here. Golik and Wingo on the road presented by Progressive Insurance. All guests join us via the Shell Pennzoil performance line. And big morning so far. Late news already for the draft as we get ready leading up to that number one overall pick by the Browns. Yeah, again, uh, we thought Josh Allen or Sam Darnold may be the number one pick, and we were supposed to have Josh Allen on set. He he uh, he canceled that. He, you know, we had some things going on with with uh, Twitter from years ago, and I'd imagine he'll have to talk about that tonight after he's drafted. Hopefully, we'll get him on uh, another time. It's been great down here. It's the first time we've been out with our bus, the Golik and Wing. Go bus! Yes, so many people uh, showed up here, and a lot of different jerseys here for the draft. We appreciate everybody hanging out here, but it's the draft, man. While we have basketball to talk about in a little bit, the draft always brings some special information. Listen, I got to, I got to put two and two together at this point. We can't say it's unrelated. Josh Allen cancels on this show, and then not long after, Adam Schefter breaking news about a potential change at the top of the draft with where the Browns <laughs> might be looking at at number one. I'm not saying it's the Golik and Wingo effect but i'm not saying it's not (laughs) so to help us break that down we are going to bring in adam schefter in just a moment adam schefter who authored the tweet saying that there is mounting speculation around the league mounting evidence from nfl coaches nfl gms outside of cleveland now john dorsey playing this close to the vest hasn't even told his wife who he's picking at this point but evidence that baker mayfield could be their number one overall pick and i know this is something you do not see eye to eye with. yeah no i I don't listen i i'm intrigued with what baker mayfield can possibly do at the next level. I'm certainly in no way, shape, or form saying I don't think he can play uh, a, a quarterback in the NFL. And again, I say this because I think it has morphed a bit the college, the, the, the pro game from the college game where players like a Baker Mayfield and a Lamar Mar Jackson, guys that don't check all the, the prototypical quarterback boxes, can play in the NFL. Uh, I just certainly have some questions about his ability to be consistent in the NFL. But you know what? Who's not asking me? Anybody on the Browns or anybody in the league who's going to make that pick. So joining us now on the Shell Penzoil performance line is Adam Schefter. And Adam, so... So fill everybody in. We, we've talked about your tweet. Give us that info that you're getting about the possibility of what's going to happen at number one. I want to be very clear to say at the outset that I do not know who the Cleveland right. Browns are taking. And they have kept it a secret, and I don't think that they're going to tell anybody much before the start of tonight's draft. So is we going to get out that they're taking a certain player at number one before the draft? I would be surprised, but it could happen. Saying that, okay, after saying that I don't know, I'm telling you, while they're keeping it secret, the people that I'm talking to on other teams, for whatever that's worth, they believe that the Browns are going to take Baker Mayfield. Now, I'm not telling you that they're right either, because I know there are a lot of people who are highly skeptical that Baker Mayfield is going to be the number one pick. I'm just going by what I am telling you. Like, I had one person call me last night who said, these are the words he said to me. I'm virtually 100% certain that the Cleveland Browns are going to take Baker Mayfield. Now, Adam, oh, sorry, go ahead. Now, I'm not. Okay, I I don't know this, but I'm just telling you what other people are telling me. Right? That's that's my job is to pass on what is being told to me. And I can tell you that there seems to be a mounting opinion from other qualified in the know people on other teams, not the Browns that the Browns will take Baker Mayfield. Now, that doesn't mean that tonight they step to the podium and they say Sam Darnold's number one pick. That could happen, right? They, they haven't told anybody. But I, I can tell you this, that if you were to poll a bunch of other people, I, I think the majority of people now seem to think uh, there's a shift that, that they'll be going towards Baker Mayfield and we'll find out tonight whether or not that's right. Adam, what's the timeline been like for this? I know you mentioned a conversation last night, but is this something you've been hearing rumblings of for a while now, or is this a very recent development? How far back does this go, even hearing this inkling of Baker Mayfield from these other teams? Well, let me say this to you also. Uh, I I think the Cleveland Browns have had their decision for a while. It's not like the Cleveland Browns came to their decision today, yesterday, Monday. I believe they had their decision weeks ago. Okay, John Dorsey's the man who's making the decision, and I believe he had that. Okay, he knows quarterbacks. He knows what he's doing. But they have made it a secret uh, or made it a point to keep it a secret within the organization. And, you know, John Dorsey may have known, but other people did not. But I can tell you this, over the course of the last week, you began to hear more and more conversation from more and more people whose opinion I greatly respect, 
who I would consider in the know on a lot of different things, though they're not with the Cleveland Browns, saying that Baker Mayfield is square and play for that pick and cannot be ruled out from the conversation on Thursday night. Now, again, the Browns have made their decision, but we're just trying to figure it out from our perspective while they're keeping it secret. So I think the Baker talk has just grown and grown and grown every day this week to the point now where the majority of what I hear seems to be Baker Mayfield oriented. He's going to go number one and we'll find out tonight whether or not that's right. Yeah, we're going to find out awfully early with the number one pick. We're talking to Adam Schefter again. This is what he's reporting that he's hearing. As, as we all know, this isn't, he did this, this isn't the Browns decision right now. The Browns aren't letting anybody know, as Adam has said. This is what he is hearing and, and where a lot of other people think it may be going. One thing I think it's for certain, Adam, those who are saying the Browns should take Saquon Barkley number one and then a quarterback four, that's it. They're going to take a quarterback, whether it's Baker, whether it's uh, uh, Darnold, whether it's Josh Allen. To me, the fun starts at two. There's where I, I'm wondering if what may be going on there in the thought process, really the, the thought of is the next quarterback for the New York Giants going to be drafted at number two or are they going to go in a different direction? Now, look, I think that we've got a situation here where maybe the Giants, when you listen to Dave Gettleman talk, he makes it sound like, he would prefer to take Saquon Barkley than he would a quarterback. Now, he may just be speaking through the media rather than to the media, okay? But in this particular case, my guess would be that there's some ways that the Giants can manipulate this and maybe say to the Jets, hey, you know, you want to come up one spot, give us a third-round pick. I know the Jets have given up a lot to get there. You'll lock in Sam Donald, otherwise we're going to go ahead and take him uh, and maybe try to scare the Jets into uh, trading up for Sam Donald and getting an extra pick. That's possible. But, but Dave Gettleman's nature, his history and tradition, has not been to trade back. He's not been aggressive about that. Now, again, every draft is different, but my, my guess would be that the Giants stay where they are, and my guess would be that they take Saquon Barkley. But, again, we'll find out tonight, right? I mean, that's the great mystery of this. This is, to me, one of the more intriguing drafts in recent memory. And I think part of that is usually – when we're 11 hours out of the draft, you usually know who the number one pick is going to be. And, and we can't say we know that right now. You know, we, we might think that there's more and more discussion about Baker Mayfield, and that seems like it's increasingly likely that he could be the pick tonight. But again, we haven't heard from the Browns, so we don't know that. Talking to Adam Schefter on the Shell Penzo performance line. Shefty, before we let you go, I wanted to ask about something else that you tweeted about yesterday, the conclusion of the NFL investigation into yep. uh, comments alleged by LSU, former LSU running back Darius Geis. What's the latest on that situation as the league has concluded their look into some questions that he claimed he was asked inappropriately during the pre-draft process? You know, the league is saying in a very polite and diplomatic way, we're not believing what he said. And I can tell you this, and – You know, I know a lot of people think, oh, the league, of course that's what the league is going to find. You know, the league doesn't want to deal with this. Let me say this. Forget the league. Let's take the league out of this. Let's talk to the the teams that I've spoken to. I have yet to find a team that believes that there's a team that that asked that question to Darius Geis. I have heard multiple teams tell me that basically they believe that that he fabricated the story. I had one team tell me that he admitted to them that he fabricated the story. And, again, I think there have been character questions about Darius Geis during this process. And I think that this reinforces some of the questions that teams had about him going into this draft tonight. Awesome stuff. Great information, as always, Shefty. We appreciate you breaking it down for us. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, guys. Awesome stuff from Adam wow. Schefter. Ton of ton of information. What a strange situation that well, is. Well, I mean, Darius Geis has had some red flags, and boy, this certainly isn't going to add to it the way the talk's been going around about yeah. that. Tough, but, tough timing there. Yeah. Golik and Wingo here on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. We're presented by 1-800-Flowers.com. This Mother's Day, show her your appreciation with 36 Sorbet Roses for just $36 from 1-800-Flowers.com. To order, go to 1-800-Flowers.com slash ESPN. Mike Golik Jr., Mike Golik Sr. here. A couple of proud notes. Dame grads mm-hmm. joined by yet another on set right now two-time Super Bowl champion and former 
pick of the New York Giants, 74th overall yeah. in your draft year. Justin Ch- Justin Tuck joining us up on set here in Golik and Wingo. Justin, what's Thanks going on, man? Guys. Thanks for having me. Well, I'll tell you what. So Go bet- Irish. Between three, hey, about you, Irish. Between three Notre Dame grads here, there's two Super Bowl rings, and Mike, you and I have none. Yes, exactly. <laughs> We're not really pulling our weight at the table, though. At least we've got two draft picks at the table, so I'm yeah. the, I'm, I'll be the odd man out on that one. But happy to have you here for this, Justin, and exciting for you. You get to announce one of the Giants draft picks for this draft, I understand. Right. Yeah, I'll be uh, announcing the second round pick uh, tomorrow, so I'm excited about that. So here's the deal. You're a a former Giant. Most of your career, obviously, a great career there. Mm -hmm. You're going to be announcing it here in Dallas. (laughs) So two things. First, how how booed are you expected to be? I hope it's a lot of boos. That will let me know that I did a lot of things right in Jerry's world. And Mm -hmm. as you're being booed, will you try to calm the crowd down by holding your hands up to quiet them (laughs) while wearing both Super Bowl rings? I I do have both Super Bowl (laughs) rings. In the Dallas area, uh, that might be a play. <laughs> All right, play. we can confirm That's the presence awesome. of both Super Bowl rings. <laughs> Justin Tuck here with us live in Dallas. And uh, Justin, we've just been talking about them. The New York Giants have maybe the most interesting draft mm. selection and spot with that number two overall pick. You're someone who's really familiar with or- this organization and the way they do business. When you look at this number two pick, what does a successful pick look like for the Giants in your eyes? Oh, man, I'm, I'm glad I'm not in gentleman's suit, uh, <laughs> shoes tonight. But, uh, you know, I think they, they're in the position that they, they want to be in, uh, as far as in the draft. Obviously, no one wants to be, you know, picking that two because that means you didn't do what you had to do the season before. But, you know, I, you know, they want to be in a position where one, they can probably, you know, get that, um, that quarterback to succeed for, um, Eli Manning, but also, you know, get someone that, you know, at two, I think they're thinking we want a, a, a Pro Bowl player. We want a Hall of Fame player. And I think in this draft they can do that, you know, whether that's Barkley, whether that's, if, you know, depending on what Cleveland does, if Donald falls back, you know, I, who knows. But, I, I, you know, I like, I like where they are, and I'm hoping that, you know, this pick ends up, you know, changing our, our, our fortune. If, you, if they stay away from a quarterback, if they go yeah. with a position, it would most likely it's going to be Saquon Barkley or the possibility of Bradley Chubb. Now, yep. you may be biased here because Chubb is a pass rusher, yeah. you know, something you did extremely well. But in your mind in the NFL of today, that pass rushing specialist type guy or that running back who can be a threat out of the backfield catching the ball, where would you lean as far as where you can get the most benefit? Well, I mean, like, I'm, I'm not I'm not sure how Chubb would fit into the 3-4 scheme. That's the only thing I would have um, to say about Chubb. Maybe maybe he would, you know, be as dominant in that position as he was a 4-3 guy. But, you know, I just feel like Saquon is like – there's no such thing as a no miss. Uh, you know, you can't miss with right. a guy. But as as when it comes to this draft, and I'm biased when I say this. Obviously, you talked about Notre Dame. I think it's two players in the top ten picks that are kind of a no miss, and that's you know that's the guard out of Notre Dame. But I think you, you, they could trade back, which Gellerman doesn't do often, uh, or uh, a Saquon. So um, you know. Obviously, if I'm taking that pick, I know who I would go with at two. But, you know, again, Gettleman has a lot of things under the season. Who knows? I'm sure he's getting calls from teams all, the, all over the world, all the country, you know, with options to trade back. But we'll see. Two-time Super Bowl champion Justin Chuck joining us, giving us the Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless, best phones, best networks, no contracts. And you mentioned the possibility of a couple of those quarterbacks falling, and I'm interested from a pass rusher's perspective, and this is really both of you guys, when you look at and you analyze the quarterbacks in this draft, who as a defender would you look at and say creates the most headaches for you? You look at and say, this is a guy that would be the most difficult for us defensively to game plan against. Ugh. You know, I I see the the intrigue around Baker Mayfield. One, he's a very accurate quarterback. Uh, he has that chip on your shoulder that you want for a guy that's going to be taken as you know possibly your franchise quarterback. Uh, I know the knock on him is his height, but you look at guys like Drew Brees and, and Russell Wilson, who I think Baker is a kind of a, a mix of both. He's neither one but a mix of both. Um, you know, he he, pres- he presents some problems because it seems like he's one of those quarterbacks that gets the ball out of his hands pretty quickly for a pass rusher. I hated that. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think from that perspective, I would go with Baker, but he's obviously not as polished or presumably as polished as, you know, a, you know Donald. Um, 
So we'll see. I, but I, I would go with Baker. I, I think it's twofold. I think it's one of the things you mentioned, and I found that in playing against Dan Marino all the time. Now, he was basically stationary in the pocket, yeah. but you could hit the greatest pass rusher in the move in the world, which I rarely did. <laughs> but occasionally I did, but Marino would get rid of the ball. So it's like Peyton you Manning. can get the quick, the, quick, the quick pass rush, and they're getting rid of the ball. The other is you get a good pass rush, and then you have a guy with escapability, a Baker Mayfield, a Lamar Jackson. Yeah. Who can not only escape, but then can outrun you. Baker's not going to outrun you, but he can he can still escape and get out. So those are the two things uh, I think that can be detrimental as a defensive lineman getting a rush. As far as the Giants again are concerned, is there any thought process to you? I think you know, know where you may be leaning with with Saquon Barkley, but to pick that quarterback successor for Eli, who's thirty seven years old, would that yeah. be in your mind at all? Yeah, I, I think. You know, obviously, I was one of the guys who didn't necessarily like how things ended up for Eli last year. That that whole um, situation. But if you're if you're thinking about the long term, you have to start thinking about his successor. You have to. He's 37. I think he still has some good years, depending upon how the O line plays, which is another reason why I, I like Nelson too. But um, yeah, you have to start thinking about it. And I think they are. Uh, it just depends on what they draft board. The Giants have really, really been. You know, really keen in like, you know, trusting their scouts, trusting their draft board. And if that guy that's number one on their draft board is there, depending on who he is, they normally take that guy. So it depends on how, how they grade these quarterbacks uh, when you compare them to Chubb and, uh, and Barkley. Uh, talking to Justin Tuck here live in Dallas from 1010 Colin Event Center. And uh, as far as the Giants, I think bigger picture, this offseason there's been a lot of conversation around Odo Beckham Jr., one of the best players in the league, certainly one of the best at his position. As a guy who's a veteran presence on a lot of teams and I'm sure has seen situations like this and had to navigate some, how would you address this in a locker room when you've had a guy who's been so much the subject of conversation, he's shown up for offseason workouts, How do, do you put your arm around this? This guy, do you have a conversation with him behind closed doors? How are you addressing this as a team leader? I think all of that. I think you definitely you, you show him how important he is to the team, but also that you show him that he's nothing without the team. No matter who you are, the greatest players that ever played this game, they're nothing without those other ten guys on the football field. And I, and that's not to say that you know Odell doesn't know that. He definitely knows that. And I think he acts that way. I think he's such a competitor that in situations where things aren't going good for the team and himself, he kind of you know, allows that to, you know, dictate his outward appearance to, you know, the masses. Uh, but the thing about it I like about it is you never heard a teammate say anything negative about him. And you know that, you know that the, the egos and the attitudes of these players today, if the, if the teams didn't like Odell, there would be rhetoric, there would be, you know, guys coming out, sources saying all that type. You haven't heard anything about that about Odell, so I, that lets me know he's a really good teammate. Um, he might be a little immature on some sides, but I think that is because of his competitive nature. Uh, I think he's a good kid. I've talked to him often. I think he he just he just wants to win. And sometimes you don't know, necessarily know how to handle that. And then as time goes on, I, I hope that the Giants get people around him that have been there, done that, that can kind of not just talk to him about it, but show him the way. Uh, but the talent is like nothing I've ever seen. So um, I'm hoping that he, he can figure it out and, and you know go on and continue to break records like he's done. We're talking to Justin Tuck again, a third-round pick back in 2005. So let's go back to that day and what these guys are dealing with. Not not yeah. so much the first-rounders because they have one night, right? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're done tonight, yeah, especially the guys we're talking too. about. We'll yeah, talk yeah, about that. Yeah, well, <laughs> I know. So w- neither one of us went in the first round. I went when it was about last call for the bars. That's how late <laughs> I went in the tenth round. You go in the third round, and, and so most guys aren't going to be in the first round of this draft. Sure. So talk about your memories of this day. Yeah, you know, for me, uh, you know, I was coming off a knee injury, so I knew that was going to play a little bit of me slipping. Um, but – it was still a, a, a great day. It was a great day to have my family around me. It was a transition from obviously going from the University of Notre Dame and I had the opportunity to go to, to New York. Didn't necessarily know New York was the team. Um, but, I, you know, like again, like you just said, so many of these guys you get caught up in the first round. Of, I can sit here all day and talk about Pro Bowlers, Hall of Famers who wasn't drafted, drafted late in rounds. And for me, I just use it as a chip. I looked at all the defensive ends that were drafted before me. There was 11, I think. <laughs> Not that I'm counting. No, yeah, no, he oh, says I no. think he knows. Um, <laughs> but it was, it, was, it, was, it was something that I used throughout my career. I remember walking into the Giants locker room 
the first day of mini camp, and one of the coaches asked me why I was mad, and I told him why, and he started smiling. And you know, five six years later down the road, he he reminded me of that. And he said the reason why I was smiling is because I knew you was going to use that as fuel to become the best football player you can be. So for all the guys out there that's not that might not go in today or the second round, third, whatever, use that as fuel. Look at all the guys before you and say, I'm going to be a better pro than him. I might not have been a better college player, but who cares? I'm going to be a better pro than that guy. Can you name all of them? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Give him time, he probably could. It's only one guy. I, well, yeah, one guy I'll say he should he should have went before me. And that I, I'll give Dallas some credit here. Uh, it's a guy named Demarcus Ware. Oh yeah. So all right. I, I think they did That's right. Pretty with good him. one there. Decent, yeah. decent pick for I think them. they did okay yeah. with that guy. Yeah. All right, we got some Twitter view questions for you coming from the one eight hundred flowers dot com Twitter feed. And I, I want to combine this into something I also wanted to ask you about. Clifton asked, excluding Giants coaches, which NFL coach, past or present, would you have loved to play for? And I point this in direction of Oakland, the team you finished up with. When you look at John Gruden back at the helm now, yeah. how much does that interest you for a guy that you've seen around football for so long? What would you, what would you look at and assess in that situation? Yeah, uh, what I know of Gruden is that he is going to have that place excited. Yeah. I've talked to I've talked to Derek Carr, and he just says it's it's almost like you're in awe of listening to this guy because Gruden is a football mind. I think everybody forgets that because they've seen him, you know, talking on ESPN and yeah. so on and so forth. He is a football mind, and so you know, I think I would love. To, I, I I know I would love. I've talked to you know Charles Wilson about days that they played with him and so on and so forth. Uh, I would love to play for him, but my personal guy. Is also a Raider. Uh, it would it would have been it would have been Madden. Mm. I would it would I would be Madden Parcells. That would be a toss up for me for those two guys. Certainly some good throwback guys there. No yeah. doubt about it. Good good guys to play for. Anything else you're doing in the area while you're here? Just kind of hanging out. Yeah, just hanging out. My wife's birthday is today, so happy birthday, oh. Lauren! Oh, there you uh, go. Thank you. Good man smart, that. Yeah, smart yeah, man, getting that yeah, one. Yeah. Thank you for letting me come out tonight. Yeah, or hey. this morning. <laughs> so, yeah, happy birthday, Lauren! There you go. Good awesome. Job. Glad we could. Uh, glad we could get that in for you. Score you some brownie points on the home thank front. You. We appreciate you stopping by, <laughs> man. Thanks, Justin man. Tuck, two-time Super Bowl champion, going to be announcing the Giants' second-round pick. Next, you're holding up the line, ma'am. What did you say? You're next in line for the water slide, ma'am. Feet forward and enjoy the ride. Okay, dearie, this does look fun. Whee! You melted me! I've melted! The Wicked Witch of the West on a water slide? Surprising. What's not surprising? How much you could save by switching to Geico. See what you've done! Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. And Wingo, Mike Golick Jr., Mike Golick Sr. here. Trey off and running towards the draft at this point. It's Golick and Wingo on the road, presented by Progressive Insurance, live from Arlington, Texas for the draft. We have had our crowd with us here the whole morning, yeah. finally being rewarded with the sunshine. And listen, they have been fantastic. We have our Golick and Wingo bus here, a couple of food trucks, uh, SoCal Tacos, the Dapper Donut. Uh, they've been feeding uh, everybody here all morning. Absolutely been, been fantastic. Had some great basketball uh, last night. We'll touch on but certainly some news coming out this morning one right now on the show we were supposed to have josh allen uh the possibility of him being the number one pick in the draft on set uh and and he canceled out of it and and there's certainly a part of me that understands that what he's going through now with the tweets uh that are that are surfacing amazingly right now convenient uh exactly about him and some of the tweets that were Kind of stupid humor and then certainly some derogatory things that, that people looked at as some racist things uh, back when he was in high school. And, you know, having to answer that, he's certainly going to have to get asked about it tonight after he got drafted. And we're just kind of s- surmising that his group, his people told him, hey, just answer it tonight. No sense in going on any and talking about it before that uh, as to maybe why he canceled. I don't know that that seems to be the reason why. Uh, the, the one part of me that thought maybe you just come on and you talk about it, you know, and, and, and then you move past it. But maybe their thought is, well, he's going to have to talk about it tonight, so why double up on that? Minimize damage, I think, yeah. at this point. What control what, what, control what, what, what you can control. What would you have told him if you could give him advice on that? I probably would have gone this route on this, and it, it's self 
selfishly for us, we would have loved sure, him here. Sure. We would have loved to address that. Yeah. But I always go back to my thought process and what I still tell guys now when they're getting ready to deal with the media, which is you don't owe the media anything. Right. You can use the media as a valuable tool for yourself, and you can control the things that are out there about you. That was one of my favorite things. Mike Tomlin, who I was you know, with the Steelers briefly, but Mike Tomlin always said, I could go into a press conference with the message that I want to get out there. I don't care what questions I'm asked. I go in and I control the message that I'm sending out. So this is all about Josh Allen exercising control. And whether it's players that don't run at the combine because they don't feel compelled to, whether it's guys that decide they don't want to bench because they don't think that's relevant, I'm always for players exercising a degree of control in their situation when they can, even if it is a detriment to our show. And even if I will hold it against Josh, if he doesn't come and join the show tomorrow after being drafted tonight. That's exactly right. He owes us one. Uh, but, But I'm with you. You're right. Selfishly, we'd love to have him on the show. But uh, you know, if either I went through this or, or one of you as my kids was going through this, the thought would probably be, okay, because that's what the people around are supposed to do. How do we protect? Yes. You know, there's a promote part of it, and there's a protect part of it, and part of this is protection. And and I get it, and I know there will be those that say, oh, he's, he looks worse by hiding from it and not going on where he was supposed to go on. Like I said, he's going to talk about it tonight, and then it's what you think about the tweets. You know, we saw this with uh, DiVincenzo, uh, DiVincenzo. DiVincenzo from Villanova, going back his high school tweets that were brought up. You know, I, it, it doesn't really affect me. I mean, I, I understand nowadays, I, I had read a tweet earlier about a gentleman who said he was riding in his car listening to the show with a 16-year-old and basically saying, it's a lesson, son, I mean, about hitting send. Yes, we're not the smartest in the, in, the, in our lifetime when we're in high school. I completely understand that. But we also can't completely excuse it and say anything goes in high school because you can just say, oh, I was in high school. You still have to, there is some responsibility that I think players of the generation younger than even you are learning more and more that everything, everything can come back to haunt you, and the universal line of don't press send by Herm Edwards will reverberate for going on and on and on, because it will always stick with you, so there does have to be a little more of a thought process, even when you're in high school, and and that's the thing about it, you probably think it's not as bad a tweet as you think it's going to be, or what you say when you hit send, until it comes back in a situation like this, and I I guess who thinks when they're 15 years old it's going to come back when I'm 22 and about to maybe be the number one pick in the draft. No one thinks anyone's going to find out. No right. one thinks anyone's going to care. You're operating in a place where your peers are and so that's where you take your conversation. You have to be held accountable for the things that you said we all do in life. You'll be held accountable for the things you say on social media in any job interview in any right. avenue in life. Right. The difference is this job interview has been going on for months now since the end of the season and this hasn't come up until now. This is an attempt by someone out there to go and try and sully what's supposed to be a great night for this kid. Any sort of slander that comes out now and the things you say about this now are complicit in basically trying to ruin the night for someone who is on the cusp of the biggest night of their life. And so while these things are objectively wrong and this is not behavior you want to condone or accept, there also has to be an understanding of what the goal was whoever put this out. It wasn't to show some egregious wrong or show some disagreeable character trait from Josh Allen. This is an attempt to ruin his day with something they could have found months ago and put out then, but the timing just wouldn't have done it. Yep, completely agree. We saw this with the Jerry Laramie Tunsil a couple of years ago. Laramie Tunsil. Uh, Laramie Tunsil, I'm sorry, where the video came out, I mean, on draft night about him with kind of the, the gas mask on and, and, the, and, the smoke, and the marijuana. It, was, it came out, you know, didn't come out before that at all. And then there's the other part of this, of the news that Adam Schefter reported that that he's hearing not from the Browns. Again, Adam Schefter does not know what the pick is, and he has not heard this from the Cleveland Browns. But all his other sources, and this is what he does, is heard that many people think that the Browns are going to take Baker Mayfield tonight with the number one pick. And I'm just getting this, and now we can say, we seem to have different feelings on Baker Mayfield. What, what do you think if he was the number one pick? What are your thoughts of him? I, I just think Baker Mayfield, it's an interesting look at fit, because it's the one thing we always talk about with these guys, is what's their fit when they get to the next level? How can you maximize it with an organization? And I just think the more you look at Cleveland, what Hugh Jackson's MO as a coordinator has been, and what their plan would be with Tyrod Taylor, maximizing his skill set, and how maybe that marries up with Baker Mayfield. Make it, maybe it makes that transition easier 
year to the next guy because the one point that's been hammered home all throughout the show this morning is none of these guys have to come in and start right away with the right. teams we're talking about taking quarterbacks. How does that benefit you? How do you align yourself strategically going forward with these kind of players? I just think interests me more than anything else with Baker. I'm with you. I think Josh Rosen is the most ready. We've heard highest floor, all these different things about him. But as far as your specific organization's needs, tendencies, and what your plan is, I think this could be an interesting chess move. I still don't buy that he'll be the number one pick. But what makes it interesting is if if it was Darnold and or Allen, say it was Darnold, was the thought. And what if the Giants liked Darnold as well? And now Darnold doesn't get taken number one. And now the Giants are like, wait a minute. Now the quarterback that we had the highest rated that we thought that the Browns may take, what if they didn't take who their highest rated quarterback was? And now that quarterback's available to two along with Barkley, along with Chubb. I wonder if that changes their train of thought. Because anybody who sits there and said, well, if they have all the quarterbacks the same, it doesn't matter. They don't have the quarterbacks the same. Nobody's going to have the quarterbacks the same. There is going to be a pecking order. That, to me, will be an interesting thing if Baker does get taken first. The Giants continue to be the most intriguing portion of this draft near the top. Draft day outfits aside, which will take a page out of the LeBron James Cleveland Cavaliers book and have a uniform look across the board. Dave Gettleman mandating the dress code for the draft room. So we'll continue to look into the NFL draft. We're counting down to the NFL draft tonight. Very excited again live here in Arlington, right outside of AT&T Stadium here at 1010 Collins Event Center. Looking forward to that. We'll keep up with that. Enjoy the draft coverage today because Monday, you know we're coming out with a way too early 2019 draft. Really? Golick and Wingo on the road. Presented by Progressive Insurance. That is Todd McShay's favorite mock draft. Loves it. Loves Can't it. Can't get enough. Can't wait. We'll be breaking that down Monday. Go look at Wingo live from Arlington, Texas for the NFL Draft. Brought to you by La Quinta Inns and Suites. Love a good La Quinta. Boundless coffee at the La Quinta. Man, they have been a I lifesaver mean, for me this week. Absolute lifesavers. Trey got in the, in the workout facility there. Yes, which, I got a little which, workout in. He is he ripped. He is ripped. Or he's trying to get ripped. So. Baby steps. Baby yeah, steps towards a brighter say, tomorrow. Let's, let's be careful. Hey, now. Baby steps towards a big night for Cleveland. It's been a big stretch here for Cleveland. <laughs> yeah, we look right. at last night for LeBron James and the Cavaliers. They take a 3-2 series lead on the back of 44 points and one of the better end game sequences you'll ever see for one player, which after LeBron's great, uh, great block in the playoffs a couple of years ago, just starts to seem par for the course for this guy. You know, it really does, but but this Cleveland team, I mean, deep down in, in a truthful moment, they, they do have to be like, oh, boy. I mean, you go back to game two. When LeBron lost his mind in the beginning of it, scored the first 13 points of the game for both teams, scored 20 and a quarter. They're blowing out the Pacers, and the Pacers almost come back. You know, Cleveland still does win that game. Cleveland, a big third quarter last night, get a nice lead, but here come the Pacers again to tie that game late and have a chance to pull it out. You know, how much do you think the non-call goaltending had to do with it right at the end? It could have given the Pacers a two-point lead with five seconds to go. See what LeBron would have done then. But LeBron, listen, had the block, and it was called the block by the officials, has the, the three-pointer for the win uh, in, in a case where it was his only three-pointer of the night. But I mean, th- this... It almost, I don't know if I want to go all the way back and go back to when he was in his first finals against San Antonio and it was him and basically you couldn't name anybody else. Because there's some other players. I mean, Kevin Love is a good player. Didn't play that well last night. Corver was shooting well from three-point land. I believe uh, Kevin Love was only two of 11. So I, I don't want to go that far, but, man, there's a little more of that vibe. It might feel closer to that first round bout against Golden State where Kevin Love got injured during that playoff. Right. Kyrie, Kyrie Irving right. got injured in the first game. And that one, LeBron James was out there with Delhi and Z yeah. and the rest of those yeah. guys. So this might be closer to that feeling. But you mentioned the controversial non-goaltending call. You think it's goaltending. I think yeah. it's goaltending. Victor Oladipo thinks it's goaltending. LeBron James, after, even admits it's goaltending. Maybe. I definitely thought it was a goal team. Of course I didn't think it was a goal team, man. <laughs> uh, I just, uh, I mean, that's, I, I try to make plays like that all the time. And, uh, you know, I trust what I've always worked on. And, you know, being a, you know, as a kid, you always have those, like, those three, two, one moments, you know, when you're a kid and, and being able to have one of those moments. And that's what it kind of felt like. It just felt like I was a kid all over again, just, uh, you know, playing basketball in my, in my house and, um, you know, makeshift hoops and, you know, my socks as a basketball and, uh, 
you know, making the, the uh, noise. Uh, so that's that's what it felt like. I made that noise a lot. It never really translated as well to the field. But those are always the guys that are a little bit more amazing are the ones where it looks effortless like that. I remember Golden Tate, who's with the Detroit Lions now, who I got to watch up close and personal in college. And there were plays where we'd look at each other on the field after or on the sideline and just sort of marvel and say, that was a play you draw up in the dirt in the backyard. That's a play that no one else can really replicate in those moments. LeBron James just happens to do it time after time in the greatest league on the planet. Well, and that's the thing. Then you expect it from him. You expect him to, to pull it out and expect him to make that play and that's what happens in big moments you look to your best players and the expectation is go do it you know and he did it i think if i have just a bit of criticism for the joke he went for in the in the presser where of course i thought it was goaltending and then he went right into no it wasn't goaltending he needed a little more of a breather dramatic right? pause a little bit of pause let people kind of look at him like is he serious or not does he really mean that and then hit him with it. Of course, it wasn't goaltending. That would be my only critique of that. Pregnant pause. Got to throw it go. in there. Let it throw breathe. It, let it breathe. Let let, let people kind of go in and, and think what they're hey, – is he serious? Yeah, that All kind right. of thing. So expectations high for LeBron and the Cavaliers. Expectations markedly lower for the Cleveland Browns in that same city we look forward to now. They're on the clock, 8 p.m. Eastern. The draft gets going here tonight in Arlington. Predictions. We've heard the reports all morning now. Adam Schefter saying other sources, not the Browns, other right. sources around the league thinking Baker Mayfield is their guy. What do you think actually happens with one I do, but you, you've kind of talked me about with Tyrod Taylor being there and the kind of movement quarterback he is to bring in a quarterback that's kind of like that is, is giving me pause to think that. At the end of the day, I think the Browns take Sam Darnold. Again, Josh Rosen is my top quarterback. I think they take Sam Darnold. The Giants are the intriguing one to me. Are they going to go back in this one? Are they going to stay there? If they stay there and select, I think they're going to take Saquon Barkley, which means and then the Jets are going to grab a quarterback. And then I think from the Browns' standpoint, I think they get their quarterback, and I think it'll be Sam Darnold. But either way, it's going to be a quarterback. And then I think they get Bradley Chubb. Uh, the, the pass rusher. I think that's who, if they have that pick at four, Chubb will not have gone before that unless the Giants do take him at two, which I don't think they will. Uh, so this is barring any trade. It's tough for me to sit here and think someone's going to jump up and do this. So if it goes in line, I think the Browns get the quarterback that they want and then end up at four having Bradley Chubb. I think Saquon goes two and the Jets take whatever quarterback. Well, that, that's a name we've heard uh, Baker Mayfield attached to at number three with Man, the Jets. Bradley Chubb on that defense. You'd have Miles Garrett from right. the year before. That'd be a couple of bookends for yep. you to build going into the future with this Browns team. And that's the understanding is so many of these teams up top have other places they need to address. We've talked about the Giants. We've talked about the Browns with that Giants pick. The Colts are another interesting team. Right. Do you protect Andrew Luck? Do you get them a name on the defensive side of the ball like Bradley Chubb? There's a lot of intrigue, but I'm with you. That Browns pick is going to tell us everything we need to you know You think about. they go Baker? Uh, the, oh, are you talking about the Browns? Or Browns. The, the Browns? Man, I don't think they're going to have the guts to. I think that's another one of the things. We've seen the reaction from that fan base yeah. all morning. This group want Saquon, and they're not going to get him at number no, one. No, they're not. No, they're but not. But there is a lot of aversion and a lot of risk in these quarterbacks, and I think they're looking for that safe guy. I think that safe guy is Sam Darnold, yeah, and I, I think, think it's going to be a gonna hard go. one for them to ignore. So the NFL draft is tonight on ESPN, ESPN Radio, and the ESPN app. You can see Trey Wingo over there. You can check out Twitter uh, at twitter.com slash ESPN. Jason Fitz, Mina Kimes, Dominique Foxworth, and Clinton Yates going to be holding it down with draft coverage there. Tune back in tomorrow. Golik and Wingo will be back here here in Arlington at the Collins Center. Roger Goodell on set at 9.15. The commissioner here. Check back in tomorrow.